Good morning. My name is Randy Looper, president of Snowasis Medical. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. David Urbanik. Dr. Urbanik is a board certified oral maxillofacial surgeon who practices in greater St. Louis, Missouri. He completed his OMS training at the Carl Foundation Hospital in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and earned his dental degree from the Case Western Reserve University School of Dental Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. Prior to dental school, Dr. Urbanik earned a master's degree with honors in applied anatomy from the CWRU School of Medicine. During his graduate and dental school, he served as a teaching assistant for medical, dental, and graduate students in the anatomical sciences. A lifelong learner and educator, Dr. Urbanik serves as adjunct faculty at the A.T. Still University Missouri School of Dentistry and Oral Health and avidly lectures to the dental and OMS community throughout the country. He has authored several chapters in various oral and maxillofacial surgery textbooks. His surgical interests focus on complex dental implantology, bone grafting, and soft tissue management. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Urbanik. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending. So you're either here for the free lunch or here to learn about amnion chorion membranes. Either way, I'll take it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking your time. Hopefully this, this is uh, real applicable to you and you guys get some enjoyment out of it. So today's lunch and learn is sponsored by Snowasis. They make the bioexclude amnion chorion membrane. It's, uh, it's a really nice membrane. They also provide really nice socks. If you guys had a chance to stop at their booth, Probably some of the best dress socks I have. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but they're, they're pretty quality. They're, they're in hot demand. Um, I haven't done any altering of the uh, pictures at all besides cropping. And, make sure, and I always make sure whenever I do crop, I always do a fantastic job. So basically, this lecture is going to boil down to two things. You know, it'll get down to the nuts and bolts of it. Why I use amnion chorion membranes, why I like to use them, and then how I use them. So basically, we'll get into some of the science why I like it, and then also how to apply it. So what is bioexclude? So it's a collagen membrane, but it's coming from the amniotic sac, okay? Now you may have heard from the literature and a lot of people and stuff, and they actually mislabel it. They say it's from the placenta, it's not the placenta, it's the amniotic sac. Maybe that's the anatomist in me talking, um, but they're different, okay? Um, the, amnio or the, the membrane itself is from the, the amnion chorion membrane of the amniotic sac there, okay? It's dehydrated, it's deepithelialized. The way they procure it, it comes from US donors who are pre-screened. They look at their medical history and, and their, their charting and all that, and they also do some blood serology to screen them. Um, and it's procured via C-section and elective birth. So these are full-term live births, okay? Um, and then they also will culture the specimens after uh, the baby's born, okay? And that's important because they don't want bacteria from the vaginal canal going on the membrane and contaminating things, so. Now it is a uh, human cellular and tissue-based product, and so as such, it is governed by the FDA's good tissue practices, and they also uh, procure it and process it according to the AATB's uh, strict standards. So here is the uterus and the amniotic sac and the placenta, and this, Fetus here, I estimate about 18 weeks of age, but what you're seeing is highlighted in blue and light blue is the amniochorionic membrane, okay? And so basically that is formed, or it is formed from the fetus itself. And if you guys remember your embryology, it comes from the blastocyst. You have the inner cell mass and the outer cell mass, and the inner cell mass starts growing, and then it fuses, and then that's what you get, the amniochorion membrane. And then on the uh, embryonic side, or the embryonic pole, is where the placenta forms, okay? Now you still have an amnion chorion membrane there, but the chorion there is different. It's the chorion frondosum, if you remember your anatomy, okay? Um, and that's the bushy chorion, whereas the other part of the chorion is the chorion leva, okay? And we all know what the placenta does, but that the membranes that we use are coming from the amniotic sac. Now, here's a gross specimen, okay, because who does not want to look at afterbirth during lunch, right? So, but what he's holding here basically is the, the amniotic uh, sac, and then the placenta is underneath it, of course. Now, this is a low-power photomicrograph, okay, showing the different layers. 
Um, you see a simple cuboidal epithelium overlying a basement membrane, and then the amniotic mesoderm, which is made of uh, dense irregular connective tissue, and it houses macrophages, mesenchymal stem cells, and fibroblasts as well, okay? Underneath that is that spongy intermediate layer, and that is actually the zone of fusion from the amnion and the chorion. And it's, it's like a light kind of connective tissue layer where it allows a little bit of mobility between those two layers. Underneath that, you have the chorionic mesoderm. Again, stem cells, mesenchymal cells, macrophages. Underneath that is a, a basal lamina, which separates it from the chorionic trophoblast cells. Underneath that is the chorio decidua, okay? And that is the part of the um, endometrium that is shed, hence the name decidua, like deciduous trees, right? Um, here's a high-powered photomicrograph showing more clearly the basement membrane and the basal lamina underneath the epithelium and also separating the chorionic uh, mesoderm from the uh, cytotrophoblast. Now, bioexclude is actually used in four of those layers, okay? Two layers of basement membrane, on either side of the amniotic and chorionic mesoderm, which are laminated together. Now, if we take a look at the extracellular matrix, we see that it's made up of all the normal stuff of like ground substance and all that, proteoglycans, whatnot, um, but also specifically collagens one, three, four, five, and six, and then laminins and fibronectins, okay? Especially laminin five, and studies have shown that laminin five is uh, is really good for the um, oral epithelium. The oral epithelial cells have very high affinity uh, for that, and studies have demonstrated that. And so it really allows the migration of the epithelium across the membrane itself. Now, one of the reasons I like using this membrane is it has a dual function. It functions as a tradi in a traditional role as a barrier membrane, like other membranes, right? Uh, but also a carrier, a carrier of growth factors. And that's important when it comes to wound healing. So it really speeds the growth of the, um, the epithelium and provides growth factors to the wound to speed healing, okay? And at this point in time, they've discovered over 250 uh, different growth factors within the um, human amnion chorionic membrane bioexclude itself, okay? Now let's take a look at processing because processing is very important when it comes to preserving all those growth factors. You don't wanna just wash them away or denature them during that processing uh, phase. So how they do it for bioexclude is basically the amnion and the chorion layers are separated, and that in turn gets rid of the intermediate layer, and then it's deepithelialized. And then those two layers are laminated together, and what that does is that leaves exposed basement membrane on either side. And that's important because now you have no orientation. There is no up, there's no down. It can be up or down, you can fold it onto itself, you can layer it and stack it, that's the way I like to use it, really layer them up. Now in 2015, Kube's group did a study and they looked at the chorion layer as opposed to the amnion layer, because no one's really compared them up until that point. And they wanted to see what type of cytokines were in each of the different layers. And then as an aside, they also looked at the competitors amnion only in membranes just to see how different processing cycles affect the growth factor content. And what they found was the different competitors, they took like five of them and they compared it to Epifix slash bioexclude. Epifix is the medical analog to bioexclude, by the way. Um, and they found that there was less, or about the same, as 25% uh, of the growth factors as, a co as um, according to, or, uh, compared to the uh, bioexclude uh, amnion layer, okay? When they looked at the chorion layer, they found that the concentration of all the cytokines was almost identical, pretty much all the way through, give or take, okay? And so the only difference was the thickness of the chorion membrane, and they found that to be like four to five times thicker, so four to five times the amount of growth factors. So that's a good thing. So when you take the amnion uh, membrane and <clears throat> fuse it to the chorion membrane, it really helps with increasing the amount of growth factors, but also handling properties and all. And you see it has over five times of what you normally would with just a regular amnion. Now when you cross-reference uh, that with the, or compare that to the competitors, they have less than 5% or around 5% of the growth factors there. If the competitors do add a chorion layer to it, they're still at one-fifth the amount of growth factors. So let's take a closer look at how those growth factors uh, aid healing and all that. So let's start with wound healing. So there's been a big <clears throat> paradigm shift in stem cell science, and so recent literature has found that or they've been looking at the <clears throat> excuse me, amnion layers, and they found that the stem cells themselves may not play as an important role as we once thought. It's the growth factors, so that's important. So if we can 
somehow take the growth factors and deliver it to the wound, now we can recruit native um, stem cells into there, okay? And then they can serve as our in-house native resident drugstore and start migrating, uh, proliferating, and pumping out more growth factors. They've also found that the amnion chorion membrane is immunomodulatory, okay? And specifically, it's anti-inflammatory. And they've done some in vivo studies where they've noticed that it can block differentiation of monocytes uh, away from, <clears throat> or block the monocytes into pro-inflammatory M1 macrophages when it was placed in culture medium that was in a normal like pro-inflammatory state, if you will. And it actually shifted the, the differentiation of those monocytes into the anti-inflammatory M2 macrophages. They've also saw that it inhibited neutrophils and macrophil migration into the wound and inhibited uh, natural killer cell cytotoxicity and the expression of interferon gamma. Now consider this, half of the embryo's genetic makeup is from the male, right? So by default, by definition, the mother should recognize uh, the conceptus as a foreign body, basically, and deal with it appropriately. But we don't see that. But why is that? Well, they've done some studies and they've shown that the amnion layer creates these immunosuppressive cytokines, okay? Specifically, a novel one called HLA-G, human leukocyte antigen G. And what they found here is this is a type one um, immunohistocompatibility complex <clears throat> that will actually block the uh, mother's defenses and actually stimulate maternal suppressor cells and protect the fetus. One of my favorite properties of BioExclude is its antimicrobial properties. It holds all the different uh, components of complement and it also has uh, several antimicrobial peptides, one of those being human beta defensins. If you guys are familiar with those, those are basically peptides that will directly attack um, bacteria and fungi and other microbes. So there are two studies in particular that I want to focus on here, and I won't bore you with all the crazy science and all that. We'll get down to the nuts and bolts here, but these looked at bioexclude specifically, and I, I thought they had really good um, science here and, and results. So what they saw was the amnion chorion membrane bioexclude uh, was proven to be as bacterial-cidal as tetracycline against AA, uh, strep mutans, and strep oralis, which are very common bugs in the mouth, right? So what they did was they uh, grew these bacterial uh, cultures, and then they inoculated them on uh, collagen membranes, amnion chorion membranes, and then these blank paper discs. And the blank paper discs, they had two groups. They had one group that was soaked in tetracycline and one without. And then they cultured these discs for about 12 and 24 hours, and then they removed them, put them in these little centrifuge tubes, sonicated them, removed bacteria, and then quantified them. And then what they saw was for all three bacterial strains, there was zero growth at 12 and 24 hours for the amniochorion membrane group and also for the tetracycline group, whereas the other groups there was growth. Now, if you look at the kill curves here for all three, in the uh, paper disc, the negative control, and the collagen membrane group, there definitely is bacterial growth. But if you look down on the bottom here, there is zero growth for the tetracycline group and for the amnion chorion group. And so both of these lines are superimposed over each other. Now the other study by Palinker's group showed that the amnion chorion membrane showed extremely high antimicrobial efficacy against strep gordonii. Now strep gordonii is a, is a very common oral bug in the mouth, okay? And it also plays a critical role in biofilm formation. So it's one of those early colonizers. And so what they did was they looked at two types of membranes. They took a collagen membrane, specifically a porcine pericardial membrane, and then they compared it to bioexclude. And then they inoculated it with um, the bacteria, and they put it on the membrane, centrifuged it down to get them to stick, and then they looked at it in a free-floating culture media. They put it on agar, and then they also had just planktonic bacteria. And when they compared these, they used a, uh, a vital, non-vital dye, and then they used confocal microscopy, and you can see the red showing dead bacteria. And so they had no live bacteria in the amnion chorion uh, groups, okay, according to the viable count recovery assay. Now, another fascinating thing was the disc diffusion assay that they did. For the collagen membrane in the upper right, there was no zone of inhibition around those little six millimeter discs that they had, okay? Down in the collagen membrane treated with tetracycline, you did see this wide zone of inhibition, but that was just the tetracycline, and it's so wide because it just went in and diffused and ran off, right? Now, in the amnion chorion membrane, you do see a small zone of inhibition, okay? But that's because the antimicrobial peptides and growth factors are all bound within the matrix of 
the, uh, the membrane itself. And so they've done some in vivo studies by Kube's group, and when they micronize it, um, they show that those growth factors are released and it loots into the wound and everything. So these two studies taken as a whole are just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of other studies out there that have identified some other uh, strains and everything. So I won't bore you with all that. You get the point. So now looking through history here, the first documented case of amnion chorion or amnion um, membranes uh, was in 1910. It was at Johns Hopkins University. And what they did was they used it in 550 or so cases for skin grafting. And then there wasn't too much going on afterwards for a while. And then in about 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, growth was renewed. And up until 2017, there were at least 977 articles. And, and I'm sure it's way more since. I, I'm not going to go count them for you. So maybe Tiana will. So. Now, if we look at the different uh, specialties or the different studies by specialty, we see that um, I would say optho is the number one. That's the green line in the middle there. But dental is definitely making gains, and so are the other specialties on that. Now, let's take a look at medicine. How are the different specialties in medicine proper uh, using amnion chorion membranes and amnion membranes? Okay, so it's got a, a big focus in chronic wounds, okay, but also burn doctors are doing this. And so this is a four-year-old who touched a hot fire pit and had a pretty severe burn on his hand. And so on day three, you can see they have the, um, it's called Epifix. Like I said, that's the medical analog. It's identical to BioExclude um, on the wound. And basically, it serves as like a wound dressing delivering growth factors to the, to the hand there. And on day 14, you can see how there is no minimal scarring, I would say, and no skin contracture, which is extremely important for a young kid like that. Um, they're using it in Mohs surgery. Um, and so they're using this basically for patients who are either not good candidates for a skin graft or a flap reconstruction or just flat out don't want to do a reconstruction. And how they're using this is basically taking the membrane, cutting it to size, sewing it into the wound, using it as an allograft slash wound dressing, and then putting an occlusive dressing over this. And every week they just change it out and you do that until you get full epithelialization. And when you do get full epithelialization, you don't get the scar contracture. And that's very critical in certain areas, you know, like under the eye, we don't want ectropion and scar contracture and all that. So here's another case of uh, Mohs surgery. Um, and then the, uh, the derm docs and stuff that I was, uh, interviewing stuff, if they did leave an area and let it kind of just epithelialize, epithelialize on its own, it would create that scar contracture. So that's one of those important points uh, with this here. Um, they're using this in colorectal surgery, believe it or not, and they're using it to wrap their anastomoses when they're doing bowel resections or ostomy takedowns and whatnot. And what they found is there's a 74% decrease in leakage rate, which I think is phenomenal. Even ortho is using this. Um, on the left picture there, that is an ACL repair, and they're just wrapping it around the tendon. And then on the, the right side there, you can see a, a, a patellar tendon tear repair, and they just drape the epifix right over it and close the wound. So how do we use it in the oral cavity? How can we use it? And usually I talk, when I tell people, I say just basically for anything and everything, and I've used it for pretty much every uh, application you can. Um, but Perio uses it a lot. Even Endo's getting in on it when they're doing their uh, endodontic uh, um, apicoectomies and all that stuff. And a lot of it comes down to the handling, I would say. Um, what's nice about the memory, you can leave it exposed. There's no trimming, so don't trim it. Just leave the bulk of it there. Just tuck it in, fold it in, just work it into different areas. Don't tack it, don't suture it, okay? It self-adheres and adapts very nicely, so that's why you don't have to really do much with it. Just lay it in, let it adapt, and stick, okay? We talked about no orientation. There's no up, there's no down. Um, what's really nice, too, is you can tuck it in between roots. It can touch the roots. It can even touch implants. And then you can also use this in conjunction with other membranes. You can place it over or under. I prefer to place it over the membranes, just right under that epithelium. Now, it comes in six sizes at the moment. They promise me they're making a bigger one just for me. But it's coming, so you guys will benefit from that. Um, but basically, I find myself using three different sizes. So I use like an 8x8. Eight eight. I'll use a 15x20 and a 20x30, and we'll see how I, I go through this and use this. Probably one of the most common applications that you're going to see and use it for is socket preservation. So just take out your tooth, craft it like you normally do. And then a lot of people in an anterior tooth or premolar will use an 8x8 membrane. Okay, And then basically just put it in there. Either let the blood hydrate it and it'll soften and fold in nicely. Or you can just 
put a little saline on top of it, okay? Sometimes you can even flash hydrate and put it in. Um, but usually for something like this, I would just like lay it right on there and then let it hydrate and adapt, okay? Now, what I like to do is not just put one layer down, I like six layers. So I don't even really use the eight by eight too much for these cases here. So I just get a 15 by 20 and I just cut it into six pieces, right? Because what's better than one layer? Six layers, right? More growth factors, more better, right? So basically I just take these and I'll take three at a time in some uh, dressing forceps and then that's when I do that flash hydration. I just dip it in some saline and then you have several seconds as it starts to kind of soften and then you put it right into the extraction site. And then I'll do that again with the other three. And then if there's any excess fluid or blood or so, just get a, like a wet piece of gauze in your cotton pickups and just dab it, just kind of wick away any extra uh, fluid there. Don't use dry gauze, it'll stick to the membrane, take your top layer off, okay? So also don't let your assistant suction on it. They would take those things in just a second, even if you do sew it in and all that, it'll pull them right out underneath the, uh, the sutures. Expensive mistake, right? So, and then when I sew this in, basically what I like to do is not just the figure eight, but I call it the spider web technique. And so it's like a figure eight times a couple, right? So it's kind of just zigzags over and it gives it even uh, securing over the membrane and also doesn't have any chance to kind of just slide out and all. And if you look at two weeks here, you know, it's wound is healed very nicely. And this is a very typical uh, thing for me what I, when I see these people back. Um, and I'm to the point where I'm not even seeing them back for the two week follow up and all, everything's healing very predictably. So I just see them in four months after I do my soccer preservation. Saves them the trip, saves me an appointment, right? Um, but this isn't just unique to me. Other practitioners are showing the same thing. You know, they do a similar technique with the suture in, and you can see the granulating healing wounds there. Here's a closer look at the suturing technique. Usually I'll do like six to eight passes, and then just put the knot down on that buckle, uh, mesial papilla area. Now for a molar, what I'll do is I'll take a 15 by 20 millimeter uh, membrane, then I'll cut that into four equal pieces, and then again, stack it, layer it, Bulk is good, okay, deliver more growth factors. So here's another case. Um, I'll use these for my immediate implants. So this was a 60-year-old female, and she presented to me, she had um, external resorption in number nine, it was, it was an unsavable tooth. So I removed the tooth, uh, did guided implant, and I like using these custom healing abutments, and so I have these fabricated ahead of time by the lab. Um, and then I place it. What's nice, you can really get that good tissue sculpting and all that. So implants placed. And then I like to do an augmentation of the facial soft tissue. So I'll either do a connective tissue graft or more commonly now I'm doing FibroGuy, which is a porcine collagen uh, matrix. Okay, and the studies have shown it's, it's almost as good as a connective tissue graft there. Uh, what's nice is just right off the shelf, there's no donor site and it's quick. So I just do a super periosteal pocket place my uh, fibro guide in there to bulk out that tissue, and then I'll graft the jumping gap. You guys know what the jumping gap is, right? Between the implant and that facial plate. And I'll use like a BioOS collagen, it handles nicely. If you guys aren't familiar with that, it's 90% BioOS, 10% collagen. And I pack that in on the facial, and then what I'll do is cover the graft with a membrane. This is where I'll use an eight by eight millimeter membrane, cut it in half, and then just kind of crisscross them and layer right over that area, and then drape my mucosa right back on, and and let that heal. And what's nice about this is it forms a nice biological seal underneath uh, that flap and just really helps prevent infection and issues I find. It really speeds up the uh, healing process. So I swear by it. Um, now here's healing at three months. It's a great aesthetic result, good gingival zenits and contours and all that. And so, you know, if your dentist likes to do tissue sculpting after the fact, even better if they don't, I at least got them 90% of the way there. So here's a case of an impacted canine. So this was a 14 year old male and he was uh, rather severely autistic and he was nonverbal. So he wasn't a candidate for ortho. So in his case, we had to take out this tooth. And so the issue here was this tooth and that enlarged follicle was rather crestally located. So when I come across these and they're down in the chin, usually I'll do like a vestibular incision and get it out. Uh, but in this case here, we're doing a saucular incision and opening it up and he's gonna be missing bone on the uh, anterior portion of those uh, incisors. So I wanted to do a bone graft. Now the problem with an area like this is trying to get a collagen membrane underneath there nicely and adapt and everything and prevent the bulk. Um, this is where a bioexclude or an amnion chorion membrane will, is really worth its weight. Um, you just put it in there, adapt it really nicely. It's gonna allow for closure and, and sealing of that wound. So we did our incision, uh, unroofed the tooth there, sectioned it, 
extracted it. Um, little trick I have is I use like a 15 scaler and I'll just take that and stick it in as like a little root pick. I just put it right into the uh, root canal system and just pull it right out. And I use that all the time. One of our, my uh, older partners came up with that a long time ago. And so there is a use for your perio instruments from your dental school kit. So I'm sure you can find them somewhere. And, but this is a, a game changer for me, just how to pull these things out very dramatically. So here's our resulting defect. And then I grafted it with uh, allograft mixed with PRP. Then I took that 20 by 30 millimeter membrane, the biggest one they have right now. Then I cut it into three equal pieces and I took that and then layered it over my graft and really allowed it to adapt in between the embrasures of uh, the teeth there. So we got primary closure and then I saw him in a week, week and a half or so. So he came back, things are looking good. Um, then I saw him at two and a half weeks and I'm not sure if it's a little bit on the patient factors or the suture itself. It just had some premature breakdown of it. I've since gotten away from this brand of suture. I've just known their quality has gone down so we stopped using them. So I can kind of blame it half on uh, the suture as well. But what you see is you know, a little bit of wound, contractual wound dehiscence, but underneath there, there's healthy granulating tissue in those papillae and there's no exudate, no drainage, nothing. It's all sealed and just got to give that time and then at four months, you can see everything healed up nicely. And that little indentation of the facial papillae, I expect that to be gone in the next couple months or so. And so this is one where, let me go back one, and this is a case where I don't think a collagen membrane would have gotten me the same results. Now, if we look at Perio, they use this a lot in GTR applications because of that, you know, the, the good biological seal that it forms, and then you can tuck it in between the roots and all. It's also nice to use it for periimplantitis cases because you can make these small conservative flaps. You can put this right up against the uh, implant surface itself. Now let's take a look at a uh, path reconstruction case here. So this is a 32-year-old female. She presented to my office uh, for extraction of teeth numbers 9 through 12. And so she had, a, I'm not sure the full history, but she had uh, or has root canals on 8 through 13, and they've been treated several times, and so they're to the point where they weren't restorable. And the big thing with her was, you can't see it on this x-ray, but right here, she had a very large cyst associated with this. Um, and so specifically associated with um, 9, 10, and 11, and then 12 had its own separate periapical radiolucency there. So if you look at the axial cone beam, you can see a very large um, unilocular radiolucent cystic cavity there. So I removed those teeth, did a little osteotomy there to access that cyst, denucleated it, and it's time to graft it. So I placed my particulate bone graft in there with PRP, and then here I did a double membrane technique. Okay, and the reason I did this, and you can use it as a single membrane technique as well, but in this case here, I figured it's an anterior case. You can always, you can never hurt by having extra tissue thickness. So I put in some collagen membranes, these BioGuide for this, because they drape really nicely. And then I place the BioExclude layered over that, okay? So whether it does thicken the tissue or not, doesn't hurt. But what's also good is it does give me an extra barrier, extra layer in the area of the, the crest. Because with these cases, I don't go for primary closure. And that's one of the benefits of doing these BioExclude uh, membranes. It really helps speed that epithelialization. And so I have a lot of residents and stuff that I talk with, and they're like, they're always trying to force that primary closure. And in the maxilla especially, you don't have to do that. You know, if you do that, you're just stretching tissue, you're moving the mucogingival junction, you're gonna create a mucogingival defect on the teeth on either side of the incision and all. So if you can just leave it open, just let it migrate over, it works. Now in the mandible, it's a different story. I try to get primary closure on my big GBR cases and stuff. I just don't like the thought of bacteria pooling in the wound, but for just socket preservation cases, I do leave them open, just let them granulate naturally. So if we look at her at a month, you can see healthy granulating tissue. You know, she did have a little bit of flap contracture, but that's not a problem. If anything, that's only gonna thicken that band of creatinized tissue in that area. I saw her back at the four month mark, just to kind of just see how things are going. I saw her monthly typically. Um, you can see how things are maturing nicely, okay? And typically with a big graft like this, I like to wait a good eight or nine months or so before I go back in and let that bone really consolidate nicely. So this way when you open your flap up, if you do, you're not gonna have all the particles on the underside of that periosteum. So um, I haven't seen her back yet, but you know, around the eight or nine month mark, you know, I expect this to be rather healed and matured and have good aesthetics there. So let's talk a little bit about the double membrane technique. So here's a case where this was years ago and I didn't do the double membrane technique, okay? And in cases where you have a fenestration or a perforation, especially the alveolar lining mucosa, 
what happens is that I just found that it doesn't heal that well. And if you just do a single, single membrane technique, you can layer it as much as you want with the bioexclude and everything. I just found that those areas are kind of tenacious to heal. And then the bone graft spicules will always try to like work their way out. So what I've done is evolved my technique and do collagen over that, long or lasting collagen, and then bioexclude over that. And that's, that's a, that has taken care of the problem. Otherwise, you have the patient coming back, you know, complaining about their little spicules. Some are better than others. Um, now, one of the, my favorite uses for BioExclude is for repairing the sinus membrane perforations. Okay? So this lady here, she's a 52-year-old female, and she had a high caries index, and she had failing dentition. And so our ultimate plan was to transition her to implant-supported bridges or so. Um, now, if you look at her x-ray closely, you can see she poses a challenge for sinus lifts, right? She has all these multiple incomplete septa, and then she also has a very errantly placed implant, you know, 50% air integration in that thing. So that was a non-restorable implant. Um, so you know we're going to have perforations, we're going to have problems, okay? So what we did was I did a double window technique here, and what I like to do with this is I leave a strut of bone there and I can come in from either side to really lift the membrane off those uh, septa from both directions and it really helps cut down on perforations, just easier instrumentation and all that. Um, but you can see I have at least three little perfs in that area, but I never worry about them because I know I can seal them up really nicely. Okay. And then on the other side, same thing, we opened up the membrane and then you can see where that perforation is at the apex of that uh, implant. The implant actually backed out really easily. It's half an air, right? So here's our resulting perforations here. And then what I did was I took a 20 by 30 membrane. I actually took four of these, and so I used two on each side, and I cut them into strips. And whoever was embossing that day really liked me because they, they gave me nice cut guides there. So it just worked out really well. Um, but basically, I took all these, uh, these strips, and I put six strips on either side, and just tucked them in, layered them. And the reason I do this, if you try to take a big, ungainly 15 by 20 or 20 by 30 membrane and work it into the osteo or the uh, window, the osteotomy site. It's going to get wet. It's going to fold on itself. It's going to adhere to some of the membrane and then not advance as much as you can. So if you take these and just cut them into little strips, I find that's the best way to get it in there. You just kind of put it in there with like some cotton pickups or something like that, and then just layer it. Even if you you miss and you don't get the whole perf. To put another layer on it and then just kind of lattice it and, and bolster it. Works really, really well. So this works great for membrane perforations and even just big membrane tears or, you know, some people just have those garbage membranes when you get in there if there's some pathology. I, I've done some crazy reconstructions with it and it works really, really well. Hard part is it's very hard to photograph, so that's why you get this case. Now, get creative with it. You know, cut into different pieces and sizes. And I've, I've used all these different orientations, so just you know, use your mind's eye and, and have some fun with it. But here are the membranes in place. And what's nice is the membrane has some stiffness to it. So when you do put it in, it touches the Snyderian membrane, starts picking up some moisture, and it gets really tacky and adherent. Okay, and then it still has some like strut to it where it does elevate that membrane for you. So you can see I, I got a nice little pocket there I can start placing bone in and all. Um, one thing of caution is when the patient is breathing, Try not to have them like exhale as you're putting the membrane in because all that humidity just kind of hits that membrane and it starts to, starts wants to curl on you and that becomes a, an issue. So if it happens, just take it out, save it for another application uh, or for not another patient, of course, but for like the outer part of the, uh, uh, the wound and then just put a fresh one in. It makes a big difference there. So we place our graft. Again, I use uh, allograft and I use PRP and then I take my membranes and put it on the, uh, the outside of the bone and then get primary closure from there, okay? And here's what it looked like afterwards because everyone loves seeing their work afterwards, right? So let's take a look at a bone graft case in the mandible. And so I like to use it to cover my cortical block grafts as well. So this is a 39-year-old female who presented to me. She had uh, severe horizontal alveolar atrophy. She also had a very thin band of creatinized tissue at the ridge. And so what I did first was a free gingival graft in that area to really thicken up and bolster that tissue. And then after eight weeks, we came back to do our cortical black graft. So here's my dissection. You can see the bony defect. I took some ramus graft from this, or for this. Did a few burr hole osteotomies, inset my graft. And then for these, I like to graft the donor site. I'm not sure 
where the split is if 50% of you do or don't, but typically I like to add bone graft in there in case we have to come in in the future down the road. Um, but what I'll do is just add the bone in there with PRP, put it over my cortical block graft as well, and then just layer amnion chorion membranes over all that. Forms a good biological seal and delivers those growth factors. Close things up, and what you see at one week, she had some moderate swelling, some edema there, but not bad. No wound dehiscence, everything's looking good. And at two weeks, you can barely tell we were even in there. So I was really happy with uh, this case. And so all we gotta do is just let things heal now at this point. So here's an interesting case. So this time I used uh, custom titanium mesh. And so she is a 66 year old female. And so she presented with severe horizontal def uh, alveolar deficiency, um, a little bit of vertical component as well. Again, she had a very thin band of creatinized tissue. It was like two millimeters thick. So I did a free gingival graft uh, to bolster that tissue. Had pretty good result. It would have been better had she not brushed on it over and over, but what can you do? Still took. So here's our dissection. And then here's the membrane or the mesh in place. And so what I like to do is put the mesh in, try it in. If you guys ever use this stuff, it's actually pretty slick. It's custom, it's made from the cone beam, and then it just clicks in basically, and then you just fixate it with uh, some screws, and this holds your bone graft. But I put this in, gauged how much uh, mobility I need in my flaps on the buckle and on the uh, lingual. Did my periosteal releases here, released over in the neurovascular bundle area. And then I did my mylohyoid release where we separate and disinsert those superficial fibers of the mylohyoid muscle from the periosteum and from the, the deep fascia of the muscle itself. And it really allows you to get good mobilization of that lingual flap. And then we created these perforating osteotomies to help blood flow and, and end osteal osteoblast migration. And then I use something called Valos. Okay, it's a demineralized cortical fiber um, and bone xenograft. And then I mix that with PRP and I put that in the uh, crib and delivered it and we fixated it with just two self-drilling screws, basically. And the big problem with titanium mesh, as you guys know, is that high complication rate. You know, they want to dehiss pretty easily. So the way I mitigated this was it was custom, which was really nice. You're not over grafting. You're not asking too much of the soft tissue. But also I wanted to cushion that, uh, that mesh. And so what I did was I did a double layer technique where I used BioGuide collagen membranes, put that over um, to cushion that mesh, and then also layer that with BioExclude over it to form that biological seal, deliver growth factors and antimicrobial properties, of course. And then I did my double or my uh, horizontal mattress watertight closure here. So at one week, we see excellent healing. Um, and then I think at week two, I removed sutures. I don't have another post op of that. Shame on me, she got away without one. Um, but here's the, uh, the membrane in, or the mesh in place and all that. And so right now we're just letting it cook and I'll get her back soon um, to get the implants in. We're getting close to that, uh, to that point. So here's our last case. And I think we're doing pretty good on time here. So um, this is one where I did vertical augmentation. And so this is Maureen, she's a 41 year old female. And so she has a bit of a long, complicated uh, back history here, but uh, I guess the quick and dirty of it is she had ortho as a child and they did an E and B uh, exposure chain ligation and the tooth never came down fully. And so they just kind of left it in a place that wasn't ideal. And so fast forward till recently, she decided to go back into uh, adult ortho. And so the orthodontist was like, okay, well, let me see if I can reactivate that thing, pull it down, maybe the bone will come with it. Unfortunately, the bone didn't, and so she was left with this uh, big uh, vertical bony defect on five, six, and seven. And so the treatment plan was to remove six. I was gonna try to do uh, some grafting here, try to at least get as much bone in there as I can at this point in time, knowing that we're gonna have to come back and then do more bone grafting, and then most likely some soft tissue grafting in this area. So this is after she has healed from the extraction of the bone graft. I did get some bone to grow on the uh, mesial of five there, but still a pretty significant vertical uh, defect. And this is how she looks clinically. So severe vertical uh, atrophy as well as a soft tissue defect, and even having clinical attachment loss on five and seven there. So, so again, my treatment plan here was to do uh, a cortical block autograft to get vertical height here. And then the problem and the worry I had was in those areas, those, the wound margin wants to dehiss, right? You're stretching things over, pulling the tissue where it doesn't want to be. So what I did was I planned a vascularized pedicled flap, a connective tissue flap to overlay that in his belts and suspenders to protect that, uh, that bone graft, you know, should the wound open up. And then of course, I told her that we might likely, most likely need a free gingival graft on the back end of that to uh, you know, reconstruct any um, mucosal uh, 
uh, mucogingival defects there or whatnot. So my facial dissection, I did a crestal incision at the site of six. I did two vertical releases. On the palatal, what I did was I did a saucular incision from four to 10. And then I went to harvest my palatal connective tissue flap. Now you guys may have heard in the literature, they also call it the pediculated connective tissue graft. But we all know as surgeons, that's a misnomer. It's not a graft, it's vascularized, it's a flap. Okay, so my goal is to single-handedly change the name of it. So we'll see. But uh, we raised this flap. And basically I just did a single incision. And just like you raise a normal connective tissue graft, okay? Uh, however, we leave the flap pedicled anteriorly, okay? So it's kind of like a tunneling type of procedure. I go in, raise my flap. And when you do these, make sure you reach back farther than you think, okay? You know, the, uh, the flap to length, the width to length ratio is usually what, one to three, but in the mouth I found it's more like five to one or so, or one to five. So really reach back, because as you roll that thing over, you're gonna burn real estate and you don't wanna come up short, right? So I mobilized my flap, checked it for uh, adequate mobilization there, refined any dissection, went to my ramus, ramus grafted, or uh, harvested the graft, and then shaped it, fixated it, and then check mobility again. Just make sure that thing drapes over passively and nicely. You can see a nice, hearty, robust flap there. So then I added the particulate bone graft with PRP. I did that on the buckle. I also did it on the palatal. And then now I put on bioexclude, and I just did bioexclude only. And the reason I did this is I wanted to protect the graft from being displaced when I wrapped that connective tissue flap over it. Uh, but also I wanted to tuck in the, uh, the membrane underneath the, the margins of the wound to prevent any graft migration and everything, okay? Also deliver growth factors in um, those antimicrobial peptides. And then we closed it. Now you can see how I advanced that, uh, that flap. We did move the mucosa a bit, the mucogingival junction did come down, but we planned for this, we knew it was coming. Here's closure. Here's the graft fixated in place, this is uh, the same day. And then at two weeks, you can see, you know, moderate amount of edema, but actually looking really good. At four weeks, the edema has settled. Tissue's maturing nicely. I gave it six months to heal. And then our plan was to come in, remove the fixation screws, and do a free gingival graft in this area. And so here we are at uh, eight weeks. And this brings us to now. And so I just saw her last week, and we're doing the uh, workup for the implant. So maybe next year I'll show you guys that, we'll see. So. so if you compare how she presented to how she is now, pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal results there, you know. Now minus the aesthetic stuff, but she doesn't have a smile line, so it doesn't really matter. My main goal here was getting the biology and the anatomy right. That trumps everything overall. So, but basically in conclusion, bioexclude is a very powerful membrane because of those growth factors. It really allows like faster healing, those immunomodulatory uh, properties. And one of my favorites is the antimicrobial properties like we talked about. And of course, with the unique handling capabilities, it really allows you to place it in places where other membranes may not be uh, compatible. So with that said, we can open it up for uh, Q and A. We got a good amount of time here, so. If you guys have questions, if you want to go up to the uh, microphone and, and all that. Thank you. Oh, and also here's my contact information. If anyone has questions, feel free to reach out to me or shoot me a text and all. Yes? You're not mic'd up, hold on. Hello, test, test. Test, test, test. Okay, how, how do you bill out for it as a uh, membrane or a biologic? Uh, we do it as a membrane. And so when I queue for the assistance and everything, we just you know, kind of estimate how many membranes we'll need for a case like that. Yeah. Can you, can you use resorbable sutures for this? Resorbable, yeah, you can. And pretty much everything I use is uh, either chromic gut or vicryl, but you can use non-resorbable if you like. Have you ever put it over an exposed nerve after the taking out a third molar? I'm sorry, uh, put it over an exposed? Nerve after taking out a third molar. No, I have not, but I know some other practitioners have. So it is compatible with that, and it's probably a great way to apply it. 
So I would not be opposed. Have you used this for treatment of oral antral communications? Um, yes, I have. So what I'll do is I'll rotate flaps. I'll usually like do like a paddle flap or a pedicle flap or so, but I'll, I'll still put that in there and then rotate my mucosal flap over that. But you're still trying to cover it all with soft tissue. You can't leave it like open and hope that it'll fill over without having to undermine a lot. It's a little too flimsy for that. So I'd be afraid that it would just, you know, get displaced. So I, I wouldn't. Um, if you wanted to do a double membrane technique, you put like a, like a stiff collagen membrane there and then overlay that with bioexclude. I'm sure that would work. I, I'm going to be opposed to that. But, you know, I think you're going to need something more long term and, and robust. Yeah, because once the membrane gets wet, it's pretty flimsy. It's actually pretty strong. It's hard to tear it once it's wet. It's real flimsy when it's dry, and you can actually fold it, and it cracks in half. So make sure it's moist when you guys are manipulating it and everything. But yeah, once it's down, it's pretty strong. One more question. Uh, you had mentioned uh, uh, saline uh, uh, to provide the moisture. And I got some stuff from the company that said not saline, but to use sterile water. So yeah, I'm not sure the science I know for sure don't use chlorhexidine because of the, yeah, you guys are asking, yeah, because of the, uh, I guess the positive charge of the chlorhexidine and everything. We don't want that to inactivate the growth factors. Um, saline though, I don't know. I haven't had any ill no effects with it. Are, are you, what are you guys recommending with saline? Saline's okay. So she's saying recommend no rinsing. The rinsing right. will displace it physically and all that. You know, I think a little bit of saline probably won't hurt anything, honestly. Chlorhexidine, I can see that being a little bit more of an issue, you know, and the studies have shown that it can inhibit fibroblasts and all that, and, and then, you know, with the, the cations and whatnot. So, yeah, if you leave it exposed, don't use chlorhexidine. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank so you. Quick question. Um, what differences do you see between using this versus just a plain old PRF membrane? Oh, this versus PRF? Yeah. So I haven't used PRF yet. We just bought a centrifuge and, you know, I use a lot of PRP, which is first generation PRF basically. And so we're transitioning over to that. I don't see BioExclude like replacing it totally. I see it using it as a complement to it. Um, you know, I don't know of any studies that have taken BioExclude and PRF toe to toe and compared them and all that. If you, from what I've gathered in the research, the PRF has like a limited amount of growth factors. It may have more, but it's in a limited variety, we'll say. And then the, the um, amnion chorion has 200 plus, 250 plus, right? Um, the breakdown of it's lower too. So it usually will be around for eight to 12 weeks or so. So it's during that time eluding those growth factors, whereas PRF typically dumps them in seven to 10 days or so. So I see it being an adjunct, but I would still use bioexclude in conjunction with that. So. Thank Great you. question. Thanks, David. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, one thing, one advantage um, with BioExclude is when you get reepithelialization because it's a basement membrane, the epithelial cells come on top of it. When you use LPRF or collagen, it acts like a scab, and the epithelialization happens at a deeper layer. Ah. So you get a better tissue thickness with it. So it, it has an advantage that way as well. Awesome. Thank you. Right. This other, is Dr. Dan Cullum, if anyone yeah. doesn't one, know. <laughs> one, other, one other trick is you cut everything square. You can break out of the box. I cut it in trapezoids so the thin part can go around teeth, or you can ah. lay it. So I use all different shapes, but... I haven't, used, I I haven't used six in a row, though, <laughs> or six on top of each other. Maybe there's some advantage. Stack them, baby. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? If you guys have questions on, um, I don't know, technique or anything, and a lot of residents are here and everything, um, you know, we can even go back to a case and, and chat or uh, just come on up afterwards and stuff. I'll be around. So Hi. with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Oh, more questions. Yes. Yeah. Have you used this membrane over infused bone graft, BMP? I have not. I have not. Do I you have be any opposed thoughts it. on it? Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think there's see any contraindications to it. So I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. Cool. Looks like those are the end of the questions. So like I said, if you have any others, just come on up and we can talk up here. So thank you guys again for everything, for your attention.